On the stage, Raquel Yurtasan, CEO of Wabi, will discuss how generative AI techniques can be applied to the physical world. Silicon Valley. Great. It's really a pleasure to be here today. And I think we all agree that you know, generative AI has taken over you know, most of the digital world, and we're seeing some really exciting things you know, happening as a byproduct of this technology. But I think the thing that we need to think uh, is about what's happening next, what is the next revolution? And I will argue that what's about to happen is that revolution in the physical world, where Gene AI can really help us solve some of the moonshot problems of really bringing robotics uh, to be a reality at this scale. And in particular for Wabi, what we're looking at is bringing this technology to solve the biggest pain points of the industry in cell driving. And then, you know, after cell driving, we'll be doing many, many more, th more things with, uh, with this tech. And I think it's worth to start by also looking at, you know, where is the industry today in terms of cell driving? What are the biggest pain points? And why, you know, it hasn't happened yet, yet at the scale as, you know, some of the timelines that were shared before uh, many years ago. And, you know, one thing to note is that there has been many billions invested in this technology. But when you look at commercialization, particularly in cell driving tracking, which is what we do at Wabi, uh, you know, there is really nothing out there. And current technologies are, really have a difficulty not just launching commercially, but also into scaling geographically to really build a product that can really affect you know, all the customers in a positive manner. And at the end of the day, you know, if you look at you know, why has cell driving been harder than anticipated, uh, you can explain what's happening by looking into the technology that's been employed, where you know, despite the DARPA challenge being uh, you know, two decades ago, we still have a very, very high engineering systems where the use of AI is actually very small compared to the power of kind of next generation AI technologies, technologies that we see in the digital world. We have, you know, hand engineered approaches that are very, very slow to develop, that I call them guacamole stacks, uh, where basically you have, you know, hundreds of modules that nobody really can interpret or analyze or understand what's going on, where uh, it's actually really hard to, to kind of tune that system. And oftentimes you will see large fleets driving many miles in the real world to try to see what is the next set of corner cases that the system cannot handle, and then iterate over and over by using, you know, human labeling, uh, manually tuning the system again, et cetera, right? So we have this very human-centric approach with a very, very slow development cycle that, you know, requires, you know, billions of capital, right? So we look at, uh, you know, how can generative AI technology can really transform this industry and tackle these two pain points. And in particular, you can think of Gene AI bringing a revolution in terms of the approach to drive the cell driving vehicles but also by trying to replace reality so that we don't need to have the need for very large fleets that actually are just driving empty miles in order that for us to analyze whether the system can handle things or not. Um, so we have these two pillars of technology where Gen AI can really make, uh, as I said, a big revolution. And on the side of the simulator, right, so the idea is that if we can actually build a simulator that is the same as the real world, then suddenly we don't need to drive all those miles, right? We can just test in simulation the system. And more importantly, because in simulation we control everything, we can also train the system to behave and handle safety critical situations, accidents, etc. something that is impossible in the real world. On the case of the foundational model, uh, you, you know, we build a foundational model that can actually do all the tasks necessary for driving. And what is very interesting here is that, well, it's not just that you're going to take GPT-4 or your favorite model, and then you can say, okay, now I'm going to fine tune it for do cell driving and then go and drive, right? This is not how it works with safety critical applications. There is a few things that you need to do from the core of the technology. You need to design this technology to be a bit different. In particular, it has to be interpretable. You need to be able to trace these decisions, and you need to be able to validate and verify the system. And that's very, very important because safety cannot be an afterthought. You know, the consequences of cell driving vehicles are tremendously positive, but also can be tremendously catastrophic, right? So that's very, very important. And you need to go beyond current technology for Gen AI to build something that, uh, where you can really, you know, interpret and trace these decisions. At the same time, you know, it's a foundational model, meaning that it can do all the tasks necessary for driving. So the advantage with respect to the traditional stack is that now uh, the entire system can be tuned from data. You can train it you know, with mostly simulation, not even requiring real-world data. And now you have you know, two machines, right, 
two generative AI models that help each other, where the simulator is the teacher and where the foundational model is actually learning by acting in simulation. Right, so you have a very different paradigm where you remove the humans, you remove uh, a lot of the capital uh, intensive piece of the, of the traditional stack. So you end up with something that is uh, much more capital efficient, 10 times cheaper than what you typically see in the industry, and also where things are much faster to develop, uh, 10 times faster. Let me give you some examples. Uh, in cell driving, if you want to do big architectural changes, it's going to take you at least a year and a half to do so if you want to change your motion planner, your perception system, et cetera. With this technology, you can do it in six weeks and without compromising safety, right? Amazing. If you want to incorporate new features for the system, for example, the ability to do lane changes or handle emergency vehicles, typically in the industry it will take you six months with a big team. Here, it only takes you three weeks, right? So you can imagine that with this technology, it's extremely powerful, the same as we've seen on the digital world, but now we can conquer this physical world in a very, very safe manner. So one of the things I wanted to do is to uh, actually play a little quiz with you to see whether uh, the simulator passes your Turing test. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of different videos and things over here. And my question to you is, can you pain, uh, pain point which ones of these are simulation versus the real world? And there was an article in Bloomberg that actually, you know, uh, already said what the answer is. So <laughs> hopefully you haven't seen that. Any thoughts? So all of these things are simulations. But for a human, it's impossible to say. And actually for a machine, it's impossible to say as well. We have a level of fidelity, which is 99.6%, which basically says that the difference between the real world and simulation is basically just noise. So we can actually train the system in this simulator and be able to really have a very performance system before you even put it on the real world. And it's quite kind of interesting because the screen is actually creating some of the artifacts, not the simulator, and it's amazing. So come and see me, I will show you my laptop uh, where you can see uh, less artifacts. Um, so what is interesting in this simulator is that this is actually a full intelligent world where basically every agent, every vehicle that you see here is intelligent. It's an AI system in itself that actually build, uh, lives in this bigger, uh, bigger system that is actually an, you know, an AI meta system, if you wish. Um, and you know, one of the questions here is that you know, we have now the diversity of the real world. We have the ability to be super, super realistic, something that you know, nobody else has, right? And the question is, well, how do we manage to do something like this? What's different with respect to what everybody else is doing? And so if you look at the industry today and how simulation works is that uh, you know, current systems are actually fairly simplistic where either you replay data, but that obviously is not really simulation because you cannot change your decisions or you are only looking at behavioral simulation, something that looks like the bounding boxes that you see on the top right, uh, where basically you look at the interactions of one or two agents uh, with the self-driving vehicle and you're only testing motion planner, which is just a very small subpart of the system. Or for those trying to build virtual worlds, those virtual worlds are actually not very realistic. Typically, you only have you know, a handful of scenes because creating one of these scenes is $100,000 to $200,000. Right? And you have these game engines like Unreal or physics-based systems that actually cannot create realistic simulations and that are also very, very expensive. So cloud providers are happy, but not necessarily your investors. Right? So the idea is, well, what can you do uh, to build you know, this in a very different manner? And the concept is actually really simple, but very, very powerful, which is the following, that if you are able to create digital clones of the world and you are just driving around the world, and then everything that you ever seen becomes part of your simulator in a way that you have a catalog of all the objects, all the scenarios, all the, all the situations, all the background, et cetera, all the buildings that you ever observe. Then you can actually, you, you create these clones in a way that are modifiable and composable. Then suddenly you can actually create the wall as well as, uh, you know, in, with all the level of realism, as well as in a way that enables you to test all the possible situations that it might happen. And that's basically the technology that we build here. Now, before GNI, it was impossible to do so, right? So now we can create these digital clones and create the simulations in real time in a single machine on the cloud, just thanks to this amazing technology. And where are we today in terms of our journey? Um, so if you are in Texas, you can actually see our self-driving trucks driving around the world. 
uh, in self-driving mode. Uh, they still have a safety driver just in case. But you know, we are marching uh, you know, towards driverless launch, which basically means there will be no human in, in the truck, uh, doing commercial loads with some, some of the you know, biggest shippers in North America. And it's been incredible to see the powerful of this technology, and this is just the beginning, right? Self-driving is one of the applications. There is so many more things to come. And I look forward to see maybe next year, uh, you know, where we are as the world in terms of how many robotics, uh, you know, companies have in the spin-off to actually continue to develop technology in Gen AI. Okay, thank you. Silicon Valley.